like many of the aspects of the music business, um, uh, music business education is even affected by the pandemic. And um, I'm going to introduce the president of MIA, and MIA is the Music and Entertainment Industry Educators Association, and um, our he will be our monitor, moderator today. Uh, please welcome Armin Shomian. Armin, you with us? Yes. I am here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sounding great. Awesome. Well, thank you to Storm and Gigi for an incredible event. I've been in and out since yesterday. There's been so many amazing discussions. And also thanks to Cassie for being behind the scenes and making all this function amazingly. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Armin Shaomian, Associate Professor in Entertainment Management. I'm in the Department of Sport and Entertainment Management at the University of South Carolina. And as Storm mentioned, he happens to be our immediate past president. I'm the current president of uh, Music and Entertainment Industry Educators Association. So I'd love to welcome two other guests. We have Professor Serona Elton from the University of Miami, and we have uh, Stacey Merida from American University. Can we just can we start with you, Serona, and just give us a 30 second uh, background, please? Uh, sure. So um, I'm at the University of Miami in uh, Miami, Florida, not Ohio. Sometimes people confuse that with Miami University. Um, I've been in education since 2006, um, but I'm also sort of have one foot in industry, primarily on the record company side of the business and on the law side of the business. So I run our music business program that has undergraduate majors who all have to also be musicians. We also have a master's program on campus and online and a joint degree with the law school. So we have quite a variety of different kinds of students. Um, and so I run the program and um, I'm also uh, more recently an associate dean of administration. And what that means, particularly in the context we're talking about is um, I had uh, a lot of work very quickly thrown on my plate to help the School of Music pivot to really running all the things that it runs um, in an online sense. So I'm happy to talk about those kinds of things. Great. Thanks. Oh, hey there. Okay. There you are. Hey. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Stacy Merida. I'm a professor lecturer at American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're in the Department of Business and Entertainment. Well, it's the Business and Entertainment major in the Department of Management at Kogod School of Business. Uh, I have been in education now for seven years for higher ed, and prior to that, I was in the industry for about 23 years at various record companies, including Jive Records, uh, marketing, and then uh, my last corporate job was vice president of marketing at Sony Music. So um, it's great to still have those relationships and those tie-ins where we can merge the two with academia and uh, professionalism. Um, so I'm always student-centered and want to make sure that they have a great taste of reality plus applying those academic principles. So gl glad to be here with you. Great. Just to get this first out of the way, I represent, I think, one of the largest schools, but we have a mid-sized school, we have a smaller school. Anybody know when you're going back to work? I know I have zero clue. <laughs> yes, no? Or going no, back no, to no, campus? no. no. Continue working, but not on oh. campus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, I think um, I don't know that any schools um, really have have made a hundred percent decision yet um, about yeah. what's happening with the fall. I mean, I expect that they'll all be operating in the fall. The question really is, are classes back on campus in the fall? Um, I feel like for most schools, that's probably what they're considering, um, as opposed to not doing anything for the fall. Um, but um, we haven't heard from many schools in the press making lots of announcements. So I think a lot of schools are still trying to figure that out and we'll probably make some um, some decisions over the summer. I think a lot of us have probably already moved at least the first half of the summer, if not the whole summer to online. Um, you know, that's happening more and more. Um, but I think all universities, most at least publicly are still, they're planning to be back in the fall, but they know they've got to have a contingency plan in case we're not back on campus for the fall. Yeah, I think we. I, I am. I'm teaching a bridge class just before the fall semester starts, uh, and that's already been moved online. But that doesn't that doesn't necessarily indicate anything. But I would imagine if I was in that decision making process, that the last thing you want to do is 
not is go back to normal and then have to switch back to online again, given the disruption we just went to. But I, I don't make these decisions. Now, since all of us pretty much have transitioned immediately, really overnight, kind of from being in a classroom to teaching online and having these meetings online and essentially our entire work life balance, I think is kind of upside down a little bit. What are some immediate changes that you guys are seeing that is happening in higher education when it comes to specifically for us, right? Like music and music industry education, because they're a little different with, with my music colleagues. There's private lessons, there's choirs, there's orchestras and band. That has completely kind of been, you know, transformed or is in the, in the process. But what about some of the music industry education? What are some changes that are kind of immediate that you guys are seeing or, or that you will have to do for, again, if you're teaching summer and you're now teaching online, are there any immediate things that you're noticing? Stacey, sure, I'll chime in first. Oh, oh, sorry, Sarah, go ahead, Stacy. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think um, I think what I would say for music business classes, and this is probably true for all kinds of classes, is it the answer probably depends quite a bit on the type of class you're teaching, right? So all of us, you know, courses at universities, and probably even in your own course system, right? They're categorized. Mm-hmm. So you have lectures, and probably most lectures are dealing with this in a similar way, but you also have labs, you have practicums, right? You have internship type courses, things where people are out in the field. Um, Certainly if you're a music school, you've got lessons and ensembles, you know, that's a whole nother thing. But, you know, even in the lab context, um, you know, think about all your chemistry labs and your nursing labs, you know, things that are very hands-on, right? So, so I think for music business, um, the answer probably also varies depending on the kind of course we teach. So um, I would just throw out for lecture courses, which is what, you know, a lot of our music business classes are. Um, I think what they've kind of transitioned to is either the delivery of the lecture through Zoom or, you know, uh, Blackboard is a course management tool we use and it has something called Collaborate. So they're delivering the, either delivering the lecture um, with the professor sitting in front of the screen, often at the same meeting day and time that they would normally meet, delivering the same lecture they would in front of the classroom and recording it so that students in other time zones can then watch it after the fact, mm-hmm. right? Some other faculty may be actually pre-recording their lectures whenever it suits them, posting those and then having those in person, person virtual sessions be more discussion, like a flipped class, mm-hmm. even though it's all virtual. Right. So there's things happening for lectures. Um, But, you know, we have, for example, a student record company. Right. And that's kind of like a practicum. Some schools have them and they're part of a course. Sometimes they're not part of a course. Those are really, you know, very interactive. Um, And we've had our student record label doing a number of even events like unplugged with the artists we're working with via Zoom. So um, so I think you know, how the, the, the tools people have used to change their classes into being delivered purely, entirely virtually, um, that answer may be depending on the kind of course. Um, so there's just... Okay. I concur with Serona. We're having the exact same uh, system and setup where we're doing some courses asynchronous or synchronous as she described. Um, the Probably the one that we're having uh, a little more of a challenge is... <laughs> calming the students down who are graduating first they don't get to do their walk you know that's a big disappointment yeah. totally understandable mm-hmm. and then the next is the nervousness of is there a job in the industry for me now that everything's on pause so it's just talking through with them um, and giving them great sound advice and then also discovering there are companies that are still hiring and they're just doing the work remotely. So that has been very beneficial that you have a lot of companies who this is not a foreign concept to them. A lot of their employees telework as it is. So we've even had internships that were able to tele, um, to telework as well as now. Uh, I have several students who are already hired, but they'll just be working from home, mostly from their parents' home in whichever state that they're in, which has really been a plus, has been a bonus. Storm, are you anything to add to that? Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say this, that uh, I was fortunate in that I've been using Zoom. I had been streaming my classes anyway for the past seven years. Uh, so it was literally just everybody go to that room. You know, they already had a Zoom room established at the beginning of the semester. And 
and about 20% of the students were already up to 20% were already attending. So, but uh, to, to what Stacy said, I, I've, I found myself that I have to be, uh, I found that I need to be more of a counselor almost now, because as Stacy said, you know, there's a lot of stress, even the transition, you know, uh, that students were making, even though my class was easy, they, it might not have been the same for the other music class they were taking. And um, so I've, I've tried to be very conscious of, you know, needing extended time for assignments and, uh, and recognizing the fact that I don't know about you all, but it is almost tougher for, to stay focused right now. I have colleagues uh, on a call yesterday that so they just can't get their research done because it's just, it's just so different now. So um, I would imagine that with their work uh, and their assignments, I've, I've, I've been really far more lenient than I usually am in the past. So I've, I've found that I need to provide that support mechanism too. In fact, we started a, an online meetup every Friday that is, is today being, um, being preempted. But every Friday, we just get together online, the students and I, and we just talk. Uh, you know, and I bring in a guest, maybe talk sometimes, but... So I, I found that changing role as a result of this. So academia is kind of known to be a little slow when it comes to change or just catching up because just generally it's just a lot of red tape as you, you all are know and familiar with. But I do feel like music business in general as, a, as an academic degree is a bit of an anomaly because our industry is constantly changing. It wasn't that long ago when Napster came around, right? And that completely you know, flipped everything. And then we had the financial crash about 10, 12 years ago. And then now we have this. So I feel like every decade there's a big change. And with that, music industry programs have really, I believe, kept up, which is probably one of the reasons why textbooks are kind of hard to come by sometimes because by the time they're published, it's already outdated. So I guess I wanted to ask you, do you think there'll be some immediate changes in curriculum now that the live industry is going to be, you know, on hold for at least the rest of 2020, if not at least the first half of next year? Will there be any noticeable changes in what students might be taught for the foreseeable future? Are there any things you're already thinking about that you have to revise for fall as far as for classes that you had already decided on teaching? Saroni, you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Sure. I mean, I think for some of our classes, truthfully, there isn't a big change, not a huge change. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can tell you already my contract class it didn't take long for us to quickly go to say, well, remember that concept you learned called force majeure yeah. um, in contracts early in the semester? Let's talk about that again. Um, so there's certainly, you know, in different classes, you're going to touch upon um, the implication, but and the scale of things is obviously very different, but the idea that a concert might be canceled or postponed because something happened, that is not, it's not like this has never happened. I mean, you know, artists get sick, mm -hmm. um, you know, concert halls burn down I and mean, things, things happen in the past. So the idea that a show has to be canceled, um, hurricanes come mm -hmm. <laughs> and move things around. Right. So, so we're not in um, entirely uncharted territory uh, other than the scale, <laughs> the scale of it. So um, I have to think that classes about live music are going to focus even more heavily into, into this and the implications. Um, but some of the classes, you know, you, you got to think it's going to weave its way into discussions, but I wouldn't say we're kind of check out that syllabus and create a new one. Mm -hmm. I don't think that in many ways, um, the industry has changed radically. It's coping with, um, you know, this sort of disruptive thing that while in this, you know, we think of short term as in, can we go back to restaurants in two weeks? Our definition of short term is like two weeks. But even in the scheme of life, two years is a pretty short term change, right? Um, and so however long this takes, the, the, the industry will in many ways go back to some of its normal behavior. We'll still stream music. We'll still, we'll go see live music at some point. It'll have a lot of distancing and eventually maybe we'll be closer. Um, but so it's not kind of like the bottom fell out. You know, there's, there's a heavy economic impact right now. And at some point we will start recovering from that. So um, I, I would say that I don't think in my mind it's going to radically change our curriculum across the board. I think, you know, we'll just spend a bit more time analyzing it. Yeah, I totally agree with Serona. She's correct on that. 
And the, the um, beautiful thing about academia, uh, unlike if we were on the business side, is we can take all of these examples and apply them against some of the principles that we're teaching. So it's, it really is like a classroom lab where we can say, all right, remember when this happened, so how does this apply? And I know that totally shifted for our, after our um, spring break in my entertainment marketing class. It's like, you know what? You've gotten the foundations, but now let's look at the applications of it. What happened? Now you see more, it's more social media driven with the uh, uprise of an uptick with TikTok, you know, um, even with uh, some of the other platforms, Quibi, Quibi coming out. And uh, even though it's kind of struggling a little bit, but there's still opportunity there because people say I'm flooded with all of these ads about this new platform. So there's still marketing that happens that doesn't stop. It just may be channeled a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Strong. I, I would say that uh, you know I'm, I won't be redundant. There, we're we're going to have a lot of case studies now uh, <laughs> to share in class. Uh, we, we're I, we're getting a lot more guest speakers than we used to in the past as a result of this because it's so much easier to go online. And uh, it might be the mode of delivery more than the curriculum that changes. Uh, you know, a, a, a lot of us may stick with a lot of online uh, classes um, after this. But uh, but no, I would echo everyone else. Not not significant changes. Marketing is marketing. It will just have different different strategies possibly later. But mm-hmm. looking at at the four programs that are represented here, I mean, it looks like. Our, our departments have handled it well between faculty and students, and I feel like students are more ahead of the game anyway. I mean, they're so techy, and you know. But do you think that there are uh, some individual programs that may be especially v- vulnerable? I mean, a lot of music industry programs are very small, and some are housed. In my in my case, it's a hospitality, retail, sport management college. You know, Serona's in a music school. Stacy's in a management business program. So. Uh, you know, some of them are much smaller than the average. Do you think um, there is some threat there that they're vulnerable or things might change? Uh, and then I'm going to get into some enrollment as well. But are, are you noticing anything or have you heard about other programs that, you know, this is affecting them much more than just this transition to teaching online? Well, I, I would say that, um, you know, fortunately, I'm not hearing that at this moment. But uh, I, I don't know if the uh, attendees, particularly the students who are sitting on this panel, know, but we are, higher education was already going to be challenged at this time and, and in the next few years, not because of any loss of quality or anything they've done wrong, but it's purely the demographics. 18 years ago, we had the uh, the recession that uh, that, for lack of a better word, caused people to have less children. And uh, we are about to hit that bubble where there are not as many, I mean, there's going to be significantly less uh, folks who are around the age of 18, 19 and about to enter uh, college. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's nothing that we can do about that, right? So my, you know, if there is any fear, it's that some programs are, are, we're all going to be challenged to compete for uh, more of these students. And that could, that could that in itself could be a problem. And then you exacerbate it with, with what has happened now, but mm-hmm. who knows. Any other comments? Well, I think, you know, if we were talking about that enrollment, you know, some have called it the enrollment cliff, right? Um, I think for all, all schools, you know, you, you need to analyze where your students are coming from. You know, some universities are very commuter based. Right. Most students are coming from your local community and um, and you'll have to analyze, you know, what is the population in your local community doing and who's your co- competition there? You know, um, whereas some universities, a lot of their students come from other places across the country. Um, and so, you know, the, the answer about how any one school will be affected by this this population change, um, it's different for every school. It's different for a music school versus a business school. You know, in music schools, you have that violin student who wants to come and teach, learn from a particular violin professor. Um, and they're going to, you know, so in that case, the reputation of the professor is going to be hugely important. And so that may not be that well impacted. But other programs where it's the program, it's, you know, so I think the answer is going to vary um, quite significantly. Um, and what we might see is that some of those decisions get influenced 
coming out of all of this. So, you know, for example, um, some are thinking that students may not be willing to fly across the country for school anymore. You know, parents may want students, particularly undergrads we're talking about, to go to a school that's been driving distance. And I don't mean like an hour. Okay, maybe it's five hours. But, you know, if you've got to go get your kid back or they've got to get home quickly, it's a car ride. It's not a flight. And if that is the case and you layer that on top of the enrollment questions, then maybe for some schools whose uh, current population is coming from heavily out of state, they start shifting their focus more to their locality, right? So um, lots of questions, <laughs> very few answers, but now I certainly think that the decision to send your kid very far across the country, um, you could see how this pandemic could have a parent thinking differently about that in a way that, that would not have entered into the equation if we were just talking about the enrollment uh, you know, challenges by itself. Stacey, you want to add to that or any other? Well, I can just say, um, to piggyback on what Serona mentioned, um, we look at it from an international perspective, even more so being here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of kids from um, who are parent, uh, their parents are diplomats, uh, as well as a lot of students who come from all over the world because it's the American university in the heart of government. And I have spoken to some of my international students and they're like, we're not sure if we're gonna come back mm -hmm. for various reasons, but one, because of what happened, what occurred, and just that thing of, it scared our parents that we were so far away, as Sharona mentioned, that putting someone on an international flight and then there were, I won't say the country, but there were some countries that when the students got back, they put them on an island in a hotel to quarantine them for about 14, 15 days with no contact, with absolutely no video contact because they did not want anyone to see the students' conditions or what was going on. That is traumatizing for both the students and the parents. So I can definitely see that um, they're gonna rethink that piece of do we ship our kids over to another country? So, you know, we just don't know how that's gonna affect, but we can start to predict some of the behavior that's happening with them. That's an excellent point. And I'd like to get back to a little bit about the international students, because I know all of us have international students. We have a question from uh, a participant. Can you speak to the long-term impacts of COVID-19 on higher education, both in terms of the sustainability of virtual teaching and potential changes to how education is done when in-person classes resume? That's a great question. Storm, do you want to start tackling that one? <laughs> Since you have some of this more, you said you were more set up for the Zoom. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and um, actually it was going probably too well. Students, uh, students, believe me, if they, when they, they were, they were, they would get upset on the days when I didn't let it stream because we'd have a guest speaker in the classroom um, and they would not even show up in, in some cases. And I don't blame them when you get sort of used to that convenience, especially as a, a person who's going to have to go pay for parking, uh, you know, and a, probably a lot and, and uh, may fight traffic to get here and all that when you factor in those things. So I, I remember a, a, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. We went online that uh, the, the author was basically saying, well, this is good. Finally, everyone will adopt to going online, which we needed to do anyway. Um, and so I, I think we could see, you know, a lot more acceptance of online teaching and, and perhaps a lot more demands from our students to offer more courses online. So I, I, I could I think I could bet my uh, how much I spent on uh, haircuts in the past year on that happening. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that could be one of the, the main effects. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that I hope that doesn't happen. So, you know, for all of our schools, when our professors, you know, got their classes flipped around to do this online, some feel more comfortable than others. Some have had more background than others, more training than others. Um, you know, and, and so inevitably, some classes are not going well. Mm -hmm. it, you know, across the universities, right? Some classes... It's like, wow, it's, this is great. I didn't miss a beat. In other classes, it's not going well. And what I would hope is that the students who might be having a less than optimal experience realize this is not how online education looks. 
this was how it looks in an emergency situation where your professor had about two hours of training and they're doing their best, right? Um, and that if we were really going to double down more heavily on online in the future, you know, you'd imagine that you would re-engineer some of your courses, right? You know, you would do a bit more to actually make that course properly set up for online. Um, and so I hope that the, the parts of it that are great stick with us. I hope the things that didn't go well, you know, people understand that this was not a full on demonstration of how great online can be. Um, you know, it was a lot of just, just cope with it and make it happen. Um, and that that same course right now that has a professor who's just holding it together and, you know, God bless them. That's what we're all doing. Um, would do it very differently if they had the training, the resources and everything in place to really make that an online class in the future. Um, so I do think and for faculty, it's helping reduce that fear factor. Now they've got a toe in the water. Um, but a lot of them will still need, I think, uh, the right kind of professional support to make those classes really online classes. Um, but I think it's coming. Stacy, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think that that pretty that, much sums. I was actually going to say that I think the the long term impact because again, music business is more conducive to teaching online. But if you if you're into sciences, you need access to a lab, and you can't do that at home. We don't want people blowing things up, you know. And um, same with c certain type of art classes, you need that art professor to help you blend paint. I've been there, you know. You need them to look at the quality or whatever you're using. I think one of the, the long-term impacts will be this immediate cancellation of conferences. I mean, academics go out, we exchange ideas. You know, it's, it's great to have this online access and you meet people from all over the world, but certain, certain conferences are made for certain types of subjects and that's where really a lot of ideas are exchanged. So I think this will have a bit of a trickle down effect where with all these conferences being canceled, um, you are going to lose out some, uh, both for a lot of these nonprofit organizations that are there to assist faculty and push academic knowledge forward, um, as well as on the other end, you know, if you if you do teach a lot online, you are going to have freshmen that are saying, like Storm said, I don't need to pay for parking, but what about the dorm fees and the catering? That is a very necessary income for a higher uh, education institution in order to pay faculty and pay staff. So. I think for a while, there's definitely going to be some economic financial you know, issues that will probably take a while to uh, kind of even out. So uh, again, it's kind of, there's also going to be a lot of entrepreneurial thoughts, hopefully figure out, you know, how can we, how can we fix this? Um, I did uh, want to jump back to the international student issue as well. Um, I assume all of you have um, international students. Uh, in my case, they are afraid of going home because they don't know if they will be able to come back. But some of them are like, I don't want to stay here for four months. I'm stuck in a dorm and campus is shut down. So do you have, are, have you worked specifically with any international students or are you doing any sort of extra something for them? Or are you seeing any of this? I'm just curious, um, you know, if there's any sort of what you may be doing differently. Any ideas? Um, I'll speak for our university. Uh, we had numerous students that... Um, were able to stay on campus kind of through an emergency housing situation for a short amount of time before they had to be either dispersed more so to you know apartments or as most went back home to their home country with the caveat of we don't know if we'll be back and a lot of that was determined by their own governments they may not have had a say their government said for them to come back uh, those with a little more autonomy uh, some have apartments here in the city, so they are able to stay. But in a lot of the cases, between the parents and the governments, they may have had to go. Um, if they, during that short amount of time that we had to pretty much um, uh, evacuate the campus, our institution was very gracious in helping uh, cover a lot of those travel expenses for them. Great. Um, I do want to wrap it up in a minute, but I just wanted to see, I'm, I'm the optimist, I'm the ever optimist. Any positive thoughts? Any last, uh, you know? Can I make one contribution? Yes, absolutely. Hi, my name's Scott. I work at UCLA. Um, I've been, um, you mentioned the international aspect and Stacy talked about international students. I'm uh, beginning to work with some um, institutions in Cameroon that are also in lockdown. And they're delivering um, 
teaching and you know classes to their students within um, the country. So uh, we're running into challenges for um, with internet connectivity, and you know how to and you know that cuts across the United States and many other countries with the um, and it's a bit of an equity issue. So it's uh, um, one that I think you know we can't take for granted um, how delivery is received. Um, you know, I really like what Serona said um, about we're getting an, um, um, you know, this is how online teaching is done in an emergency. And I don't think people really get that. Um, we're learning a lot of lessons, but how we can do debriefs on this is going to be a, um, a real challenge. You know, from IT departments who didn't know how to do this, to instructors that didn't know how to do this, to students who didn't know how to, you know, learn in this way it's a um you know having an opportunity after or uh, during this great pause of 2020 that to think how we learn and how we teach and how we support instructors is uh, something i'm going to be thinking about for a while thanks for sharing that scott yeah thank you and actually that goes back to Serena's point in that as, as faculty it was just like overnight so like Serena said we were given a couple of hours hopefully if things continue for a while we have a little bit of t more time breathing room in the summer to at least train ourselves a little better but to your point about internet connectivity I have domestic students that live out in the country you know they're not in a mega city there's no internet there they use a satellite internet and it can be very slow so that's, I think that's why it's important to try to record. Sometimes I put secret links on YouTube just so they can keep up with um, some of my lectures or I send them the audio file, whether they listen to it or not, I don't know. But. Well, and some of us faculty, I've had my internet go out while I'm doing yeah. something like yeah. a video. My home internet sucks sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, AT&T. <laughs> um, and you know, some, some of our students, um, you know, I'd heard they were a bit stressed out and I was trying to imagine why. And you know, we have our own computers as professionals and, you know, we maybe were lucky enough to live in the kind of house where you have a room you can go into that may be separate from your kids. But we might have a student who has their laptop at home and whoever knows where, and they've got two younger siblings who don't each have separate laptops. So they're all competing for computer time, um, you know, with the dog barking, with everything else. So, um, you know, whereas a student who sets out to take an online degree often for a graduate school, right? They have the computer, they know they have the time, the space, the quietness. Um, so it's kind of was a crash course for everybody. And I was being a little sarcastic. We had a little more than two hours, but still it was, um, it was not like going through a training course on how to be an online professor, right? It was a crisis. <laughs> Well, I, I, I do want to thank uh, our panel. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Serona, Stacy, and Storm for joining us. I put the link to the Slack. It's been, Slack has been great. I've joined other Slacks uh, at this conference and I've chatted a lot with panelists. So feel free to continue the conversation there. And thanks again, guys, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Thank you. For, uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Armin, for taking the lead. And yeah, jazz hands or however, uh, I'm, I'm playing a dual role here, but uh, uh, we certainly want to thank you all for, for taking part uh, in this. And, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with all three of these folks, and it's, it's always been an honor and, to work with them. And I've always learned so much, and that tradition continues today, hearing their insights. Thank you.